Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana, siphysicians.org. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members, thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Hoosiers in limbo after the president this week signaled the end of DACA. Yeah, it has me stressed out. Like, we're just waiting to see what really happens. A legal expert joins us to discuss the impact and what's next. Leaky pipes like this are just one of several challenges a Vigo County High School is up against. Up next, we'll go inside and learn what some possible solutions might be. Plus, the state has a new budget architect. How could that impact the state's spending priorities? Our State House reporter explains. And we'll go back to the 1800s. A museum is providing lessons about medical treatment that are still relevant today. You could kind of expose them to the symptoms of diseases so they would recognize them in patients. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Administrators are opening the doors of the Vigo County High Schools to give residents a closer look at the challenges they say they're up against. All three schools are, are in need of renovations and some say new buildings are necessary. As Lindsay Wright reports, it's unclear how the county will pay for it and what expenses the county and city should prioritize. Walking through North Vigo High School, it quickly becomes evident why school administrators are pleading for renovations. And you walk in every day just not sure what's going to be the next crisis, so to speak. Aaron Hughes has several responsibilities as the assistant principal, including school improvement, safety and security, and facilities management, which lately is taking up a lot of his time. The electrical is not really up to code for a, you know, I mean, for a uh, computer lab. Plumbing needs fixed, the roof leaks, and the HVAC system is always under repair. That just came off and it just made this, you know, psh, real loud sound but it, it blew apart at like probably 11 o'clock one morning during school and this entire academic wing went straight to heat. Hughes says the inconsistencies in temperature don't make for a suitable learning environment. The long list of needs also includes equipment upgrades and simple resources for students. The other high schools are in need of renovations as well and the school board is even considering constructing new buildings, which is the most costly option. But it's not clear yet on how it would all be paid for. Resident Michael Howard has two kids who attend North Vigo. He says a tax increase would be worth it, but a referendum would only waste time. I would stress to the community members and taxpayers, you know, come out and look at the facilities. A referendum will only delay this process to get started, and the timing needs to start as soon as possible. But city and county officials are facing budget problems of their own. City leaders are trying to climb back from a nearly $8 million deficit. County council members are trying to cut nearly $7 million from their budget while considering a public safety tax to increase revenue for a new jail. Purdue University professor Larry DeBoer says property tax caps, which have been in place since 2009, have had a major impact on the city. The caps limit homeowners' payments based on their assessed value. Terre Haute is losing more than 30 percent of their tax levy to the tax caps, which means that 30 percent of the uh, revenue that they intend to collect from the property tax uh, is not collected. DeBoer says the best solution to the financial woes is to generate more property taxes. And that would help with schools, too. Economic development tends to generate population growth, and population growth tends to generate economic development. More population means more kids, more kids means more state aid. But that's easier said than done. Howard says finding ways to fund schools, though, should be the first priority. 
you know, we're talking about a lot of tax increases in Vigo County, but I think, you know, one that definitely needs to be focused on is the education of the schools first uh, prior to some of the other projects that may be on the table currently. Hugh says he and other school staff work with what they have, but there's only so much they can do. But what's behind everything, what's uh, you know, on the other side of these tiles above us and, and behind walls and lockers and everything, there's just a lot of issues and um, we know what those are, you know. Not everybody sees them, but we know what they are. He says he doesn't care whether the school is renovated or rebuilt, he just wants a solution. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Lindsay Wright. There is one more scheduled open house. It's September 14th, the same day the city council meets to discuss its budget. Well, 10,000 people in Indiana have DACA status. That's out of 800,000 nationwide. The DACA program provides protection from deportation for some undocumented immigrants brought to the U.S. as children. President Trump this week signaled the end of the program. The news that DACA's future hinges on a six-month window for Congress to act sparked feelings of tension, fear, and uncertainty among those who spoke on the front lawn of St. Gabriel Catholic Church. One member of the audience was Mauricio Garcia. The 16-year-old high school student is a DACA recipient himself and says he showed up to support his fellow Hispanics. Yeah, it has me stressed out. Like, we're just waiting to see what really happens. Garcia says his plans are to keep getting good grades and to focus on his goals. So a lot of uncertainty here. Christine Pop joins us now to talk about the implications of Trump's DACA announcement. Christine, thanks for being here. Uh, first of all, can you explain just a little bit about what DACA grants recipients? Sure. DACA is a deferral of deportation, so it provides protection from deportation. It lasts for two years, and during those two years, the individual who has DACA can have work authorization, and that means permission to work. So Trump is essentially passing this on to Congress. What all entails this at this point now? Yeah, so right now there are about 800,000 people nationwide who have DACA, and over the next couple of years, those work authorizations and statuses will slowly become invalid. So we have until March 5th, or Congress has until March 5th to make yeah to make to make a decision. Uh, right now, uh, people who have already applied to renew their DACA or have already applied initially, their applications are still pending, and individuals whose whose status will expire before March 5th have until October 5th to renew. But if for all of the other people whose statuses expire after March 5th, 2018, they will just be out of status if Congress does not act. So what does have to happen in, co in Congress? Can you walk us through that process? Sure. Well, there's a pending legislation called the DREAM Act. And in fact, this has been pending or introduced at various times since 2001, often by uh, Dick Durbin. Uh, former Senator Luger was a huge proponent of the DREAM Act, and it's been introduced many times. So it's pending. There's a bill pending in the Senate, and I believe also in the House right now, which would provide additional protection to children who were brought here, as, or people who were brought here as children. So if Congress doesn't get that consensus, does that mean that, what, that 10,000 Hoosiers could be deported? What happens? Well, over the next two years, they will slowly lose their status and they will lose that protection from deportation. So yes, it is possible that we will start seeing more deportations of young people. And again, remember, these are people who came here as young children and who've grown up here. So, you know, we've heard from university leaders, business executives who've called the move harmful and cruel. Uh, legally, what can they do to protect DACA students or workers? There's not much that anybody can do. It's really up to Congress right now or the president if he wants to extend the executive action. But short of Congress acting to protect them, there's not much anybody can do. Okay. Thank you very much for being here. Yeah. Appreciate it. Governor Holcomb and five mayors are in Japan as part of an economic development trip. They left yesterday. The governor's office says Japan is the state's largest foreign investor and the trip encourages continued investment and trade. Columbus Mayor Jim Linup is part of the delegation. He views it as opportunity to strengthen relationships between his city and Japan.
We've got 26 companies in Columbus that are, uh, are owned or have Japanese ownership. And so part of what we do is just go back over there and, and talk to the executives in Japan and, and make sure they understand thank you. You know, we appreciate the investment. In addition to meeting with Japanese companies that have operations here, the team will meet with Japanese government officials and national business chambers. The group returns to the U.S. September 15th. Delta is going to start offering nonstop flights to Paris in May. The airline is getting incentives from the state worth $5.5 million. Delta plans to offer at least three flights a week. The airline is required to meet a minimum passenger threshold to claim the state's full incentive package. Critics have said the deal amounts to state government subsidizing a private company. Governor Holcomb says he prefers the term incentivizing. Over the next couple of months, thousands of migratory birds will be visible in Indiana as they make their way south to warmer climates. They actually are going to start now. <laughs> so early September is the best time to see fall migrants. Allison Gillette is the non-game bird biologist for the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. She says dozens of varieties can be spotted as they make their way through the state between now and late November. One of the more noticeable migratory birds are sandhill cranes because the three-foot-tall birds travel in massive flocks. And you can see them at Jasper Pulaski, a fish and wildlife area up north. Um, sometimes in a day they'll get around 20,000 birds. We've had peaks of 40,000 birds. So <laughs> imagine the sky being covered, blackened by birds. The cranes can be seen in the state between early October and December. One of the most classic ice cream flavors is becoming much more expensive. As Sophia Salabi reports, it's because vanilla bean prices are skyrocketing. In 2011, a pound of vanilla bean extract cost roughly $11. Now that same amount costs nearly $200. The increase is a result of higher demand, as well as a devastating hurricane that hit Madagascar, which produces more than half of the world's vanilla supply. The dramatic price hike is negatively affecting local businesses. Hillary Martell co-owns Bloomington ice cream shop Hartzell's. She says the business has had to adapt. We've had to limit um, any bulk sales as well as sales of, mil of milkshakes because milkshakes have a large amount of ice cream um, in them. So we're kind of trying to ration it, if you would say. Martell says she hopes a productive 2017 crop will eventually lower prices. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Sophia Salaby. But vanilla beans take a while to produce. It can take anywhere from two to seven years for vanilla plants to grow large enough to bloom. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. The state's budget chief is out. Luke Kenley retired. He was often called frugal and moderate, but what about his replacement? Our State House reporter joins us coming up. And we visit the Medical History Museum and explain how the lessons learned here are inspiring current practitioners. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. Ten thousand. Fifteen? Fifteen, you think? Twenty. Twenty-one thousand? Six hundred. Twenty. Eighteen five. Twenty-four. It's at least forty. Look, yeah, look at 4, it. Forty-five hundred thousand. Six fifty. Twenty. Six fifty. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way! I knew it. It's just a blanket. Laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. State Senator Luke Kenley is retiring at the end of the month. A GOP caucus met this week to determine who would serve out the remainder of Kenley's term, which expires in 2020. Now, it came as a surprise to many when the caucus picked Victoria Sparts. 
this is my home, this is my roots, this is my country and my future. And I want to help some younger people to bring some perspectives and really worry about the trends. Sparks was not the candidate Kenley lobbied for. Our State House reporter, Brandon Smith, joins us now. Brandon, what can you tell us about Sparks? Well, she may be a newcomer to political office, but she is not new to the political scene. She was the vice chair of the Hamilton County Republican Party. She also is currently the CFO in the office of the Indiana Attorney General. She's a professor of accountancy at IU Kelly's School of Business, and she has an interesting personal background here, too, that she talked a lot about in the caucus. She was born and raised in the Ukraine and immigrated to the United States about 17 years ago. So, Brandon, I guess she wasn't a slam dunk pick. Do you feel like it's going to be difficult for her to unite the party, just kind of given out on how the vote played out? Well, not necessarily. It's true. Senator Kenley did back her chief opponent in this race, uh, Noblesville Common Council President Megan Wiles, and the two of them did go a full six ballots before Sparks came out on top. But she's in the seat now, and she has a full three years in the district to sort of rally support behind her before it's up for election again. And it'll really be her service in the Senate that decides the party unity behind her. So, Brandon, Kenley was one of the state's most powerful lawmakers, and he was the chief budget writer. Will Sparts inherit his responsibilities? No, she now just becomes the most junior member of a 50-person Senate, and we don't even know yet what committees she'll serve on. Uh, that said, Senator Kenley, as chair of the Appropriations Committee, that position will now go to his second-in-command on that committee, Ryan Mishler from up in Bremen. So Kenley was considered to be frugal. What about Ryan Mishler? Well, Ryan Mishler is a Republican after all. Uh, it's unlikely that there will be a significant philosophical shift now that Mishler takes over that seat. But it's tough to say exactly what he'll be like in that position. And we'll really only start to get a sense of what he'll be like this next session because 2018 is a non-budget year. All right. Thank you very much, Brandon. Thank you, Joe. Indiana has been making significant medical advances for more than a century. And some of the challenges the state faced with mental health in the 18 and 1900s are even still being battled today. You can see some of the state's medical past on display at Indiana's Medical History Museum. Museum officials believe preserving the past is an important part for the future of medical treatment, but the museum has its own challenges in making that possible. As you walk through Indiana's Medical History Museum, you'll see things like full-bodied skeletons, parts of the human brain, and autopsy tables. The museum transports you to the late 1800s when Central State Mental Hospital opened on the west side of Indianapolis. So this is an aerial view of the hospital grounds that was taken in 1921. Uh, this is our building, 1896, the old pathology building. Central State was one of the first progressive mental health hospitals of its kind. It opened during a time when medical professionals knew very little about mental disease. And the idea was that uh, they would treat these mental diseases as just that, a disease. You know, these were people who had something wrong with them that could potentially be fixed. So doctors and medical students from around the world would gather in this building for lectures, live autopsy demonstrations, and to conduct research about mental health. Museum Executive Director Sarah Halter says what makes this museum so rare, though, is that nearly everything is original. These things were actually used during the 18th and 19th century and then left behind. Everything from patient records and medical equipment to photographs. Photography was becoming an important part of medical education when this building opened, and they wanted to create teaching aids and supplement journal articles and kind of document their research. So this is a replica. Uh, if you would like to try it, the card itself is original. You could kind of expose them to these symptoms of diseases so they would recognize them in patients. The pathology building opened as a museum in 1968, but it wasn't until 1994 that the hospital completely shut down following abuse allegations and funding problems. But Halter says the history serves an important purpose for the present and even the future. Not just this building, but the, the whole site, the whole former grounds of the hospital is kind of a tangible reminder of, of a time when, uh, you know, 
doctors were trying to get away from the idea that these these people were were bad, that they should be treated like criminals, and kind of moved towards treating them as people with diseases that could be helped. It's an issue communities struggle with to this day as residents battle addiction and other mental health disorders. Jails are crowded with those suffering mental disease. Not only are museum officials battling to preserve the history, though, they're also fighting to preserve the physical building that holds it. The building is funded primarily through donations and admission fees. We hired a architectural firm to do an assessment of the building and what we got back was a binder about an inch thick full of things that were wrong with the building and so some of it is pretty severe. Officials launched a capital campaign in 2015 to fix several issues with the roof, the HVAC and electrical systems, among other things. But there is good news. The museum is already a third of the way to its goal with the campaign and attendance has risen significantly in the last few years anywhere from 10 to 25 percent each year since 2014. Last year, the museum welcomed 8,200 visitors. We want to save this building. We, we want this building to still exist for future generations. It's an incredible piece of history, and if lost, it can't be replaced. So that's really our focus right now. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Lindsay Wright. The museum has a rather large collection of donated items in storage. Officials hope to expand in the future by opening a more traditional style museum. But for now, the focus is on saving the museum that's currently open. Eleven dogs displaced by Hurricane Harvey are awaiting adoption in Indianapolis. The Humane Society is caring for the dogs. And as Becca Costello reports, the shelter might also take in dogs from Florida as that state braces for Hurricane Irma. Hurricane Harvey dumped more than 51 inches of rain on the Houston area. Widespread flooding has pushed tens of thousands of people out of their homes. That means Texas animal shelters are filling up fast. So the shelter dogs go to other shelters, humane societies and private shelters um, in, in other cities so that the shelters then can accept dogs that are being rescued from the floods with the hopes of reuniting them with their owners or their families. The 11 dogs, ranging from chihuahuas to labradors, flew into Chicago Sunday. Stolen says a lot of Midwest cities got dogs because the relatively short flight puts less stress on animals, like Brownie. Um, she just needs uh, time to build her confidence here because she's really, really scared. She's been through a lot. Stolen says the shelter is already in contact with authorities in Florida as animal organizations there prepare for Hurricane Irma. It's expected to hit the U.S. early next week. We have a, a lot of animals here, but, but it's, we have a weekend to adopt them. And if we have a great adoption weekend and people come to the shelter and adopt animals, we'll have room again and, and we will respond accordingly and we'll respond the best way we can. Stolen says animal rescue efforts in Texas and Florida will continue for several weeks. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Becca Costello. The 11 dogs in Indianapolis should be up for adoption within the next week. Well, when a tornado barreled through Kokomo in August 2016, it damaged homes and businesses and it uprooted hundreds of trees. A coalition that includes Indiana's Wildlife Agency will begin planting more than 500 trees in Kokomo to replace some of those that were destroyed. The plantings will occur in three waves starting in November. The city of Columbus is celebrating its architecture and design. 18 recent art installations are positioned in a way that connects to the city's design legacy. So if you've toured the city before, Exhibit Columbus is a new way to experience it all over again. We're uh, behind the Irwin Conference Center, which is the former Irwin Union Bank. It's a national historic landmark that was designed in 1954 by Aero Saarinen. And what's behind me is something that was designed this year and made this year uh, in a competition uh, as part of Exhibit Columbus. This is an installation by Euler Wu Collaborative, which is a duo from Los Angeles that made a project that sort of wraps around the existing bank tellers and makes a new and interesting space for the community to use. Um, a little bit, uh, a few blocks away is something called uh, Another Circle by Aranda Lash, which is a really uh, emerging architecture and design firm that repurposed 1,100 pieces of off-cut limestone from Bybee Stone in Bloomington and arranged them in this really interesting way that gives you a new reason to be out in the park. This is really 
um, in a sense, a way for the community to put a platform out there to say, let's see what Columbus does with these spaces and let's see how we use them. Let's see how we use downtown. Let's think about the future. As you see, you can walk in or on most of the exhibits, which leads to a different level of interaction with the art. Exhibit Columbus worked with five international design galleries to create the Washington Street installations. Six Midwestern universities are showcased, and there's even a high school installation. You have until November 26th to check it all out. And IU football head coach Tom Allen says his team is getting ready for its most important game of the season. Virginia, because it's the next game, and that's how we approach it. And that will be the case every single week. The goal is to be 1-0 at the end of this week. In his home debut game, Allen's team suffered a hard loss to Ohio State. Allen says his team isn't taking the loss lightly. They're learning from their mistakes and focusing on moving forward. It's a culture change. It's an expectation. And, you know, we're raising the expectations here. You know, people are, and I share in that disappointment when you don't beat the number two team in the country and you feel like you should have, even though we um, didn't and uh, had a, a large gap at the end. But the bottom line is, is that's where we want to be. The Hoosiers play at Virginia Saturday at 3.30. And that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, primary care and specialty care providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu and by WTIU members. Thank you.